sing this out. We're going to sing the chorus of this song first. It's going to say, Oh, happy day. Sing like this. Go. Oh, happy day. Happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day. Happy day.
continue in worship.
seated. We're going to pray before our morning offering. Dear Heavenly Father, God, just thank you for everybody that's here, Lord. Um, Lord, I just pray that you just be with us this morning, Lord. Just fill our hearts, open our hearts to your word, Lord. Um, whoever the message is for, it's for all of us, God. But if it speaks to, to one person specifically, Lord, um, that they need to hear it, Lord, I just praise you for that. Um, I thank you for just a new day, Lord, that we can wake up and worship you, Lord, in your house. I thank you for the freedom to worship. Lord, where everywhere else in the world is just in chains, Lord, as far as Christianity, God, we still have the freedom here in the United States to worship you, Lord. I'm just so thankful. Um, thank you for your mercy, Lord, your forgiveness, and your love. Uh, so, Lord, we just give you this time. We hope it, we hope it honors you, Lord, and uh, just be with us here this morning. Just accept our offerings this morning as we give them to you, Lord. We give back what you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. and the offering buckets going around. I have a few announcements for you this morning. One is that we have a special speaker who's not me this morning, but I am very fond of her. It's Michelle, my wife Michelle. She is giving this morning's message about fear. Um, I was praying about it a few weeks ago and I couldn't quite come up with anything and I was thinking that I thought, you know, I feel like Michelle should speak coming up soon before she goes back with the baby. And then I just could never get quite peace about it. I knew I was going to be talking about fear coming up, and then I got home that night, and she just wrote this thing on Facebook about fear and battling fear, and it was so beautiful, and I felt like that was just good confirmation from the Lord that it was her Sunday to speak, that the message was with her this morning. So I got a lot of confidence in her this morning. Um, as the offering bucket, let's see, they're getting toward the back. Um, one thing I do want to mention, though, is that our small groups are going to be starting back in uh, the first week, actually the second week for the women of March, and they're going to run through May. They got one person likes small groups out here. That's, that's, that's a small group, all right. That's, uh, but one person, you know, when we get together in people's houses throughout the work week. Um, it'll be on Tuesdays and where are the women meeting? Mondays or Wednesdays? We hadn't decided yet. But uh, throughout the work week, and we meet in people's homes, and we don't just do a Bible study. We meet and we kind of, one person brings a five minute devotion usually, and then we spend the rest of the time doing what? Uh, country folks do best and that's talking uh, and the goal with that is to talk about something more than just the ball game that we saw on this past Friday night or uh, talk about hunting and fishing but to talk about really deep spiritual things that you just don't talk about uh, as you're meeting each other in the parking lots on Sunday so that's starting in March another thing related to that is uh, after today's message we will have connections and what uh, for those of y'all that are new and haven't or haven't ever stayed for connections what Connections is, is that we, it's our, it's our version of Sunday school, and we kind of do it backwards. You know, traditional churches have Sunday school before church, and then, you know, they'll have regular service. Well, we, we will invite everybody to come worship with us, and if you don't choose to stay for that, you're free to go on home. But uh, about 10 minutes after the service ends, we kind of throw some chairs up, and we kind of have that small group setting up here where we'll talk about today's message. So we invite you to stay for that. If you've never stayed for it, try it out. You'll get to meet more of your church family and get to know uh, more of them on a personal one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, what was my last, next announcement? Oh, yes. Some of y'all might notice that the crowd is a little bit thin this morning. We're missing about 40 of our usual people. Uh, 20 of them decided just to go on, a, on a, a ski trip and just not invite the pastor. So I'm here. I, I guess they got an email group together and decided they were going to go skiing, but you know, I wasn't invited, so don't feel bad. So. Anyway, and the rest of them have just been crushed by the flu virus that's been going around this week. So uh, I'm going to remind you, I'm sound like your mom up here. Wash your hands after you leave before you go to the buffet line at Golden Corral. Okay, because then you're going to give it to everybody in Greenville. And then churches in Greenville are going to be in our same shape. Uh, with that being said, also, one of our uh, usual crew is out this Sunday because they didn't have the flu. They're not on vacation. They had brain surgery this week. Um, and that was Christy. And we all love Christy Dale. Uh, husband of Stephen Dale from Addis World Entertainment. Um, that's just a good praise report that God is still doing miracles. Uh, we went. I went up there Wednesday morning and I saw her. She was getting the surgery. I've never noticed anybody that's had. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never seen it before. Somebody has brain surgery Wednesday morning and Thursday afternoon they're sent home. So that's a praise report right there. 
Um, she is doing well. Um, the tumor is still said to be non-cancerous, and she's expected to make a full recovery. But she is at home with her doggies this morning. Your pastor was supposed to go out and get her car last night, but I forgot while I was out because I had Eli, and he was crying and being like his mama. And, uh, yeah, shots fired. Um, so I had to make a card for Christy. All right, so... Uh, that being said, I'm going to pass this card around. I'm going to have it at the back door for anybody that wants to sign this card. Please sign it because she needs to know that, that we love her and we're supporting her and we're thinking about her. Um, with that being said, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to give you all something better to look at than I am. And that is my dear, beautiful, brown-eyed wife, Michelle. Yep, I'm good. All right. Am I on? Am I good? Okay. Thanks for feeling sorry for me and clapping when he walked off. Um, last night, actually, he did go pick up some to-go food for us, and he was gone and came back and said that he forgot to get the card. And I said, well, you know, we have cards that we bought from the church that's like for people like that. Now, they might not have dogs on them. Um, and he said, well, I, I'm going to make this card. So he sat down and he started making it. And he, it's funny thing is, is he says that, you know, Eli was crying like me but actually Eli was crying because Eli had gas like his dad so the <laughs> shots fired back right um, so he told me to not be funny so I'm glad he actually gave me that out but um but anyway, yeah, we have been battling. Talk about battling fear. Our baby that normally doesn't cry for any reasons other than when he has to go to the bathroom has been um having trouble getting out his gas this week so um this really relates to my message in a weird way but and I'll, I'll kind of tell you about that as we go on um today I'm going to be talking about finding freedom which we all want to do I mean we all live in this wonderful nation you know we can't question that even with everything that goes on every different belief that we have every way that we think we're supposed to find freedom in America or we think leaders are supposed to give us that freedom them and lead us into that um, we know that we have the ultimate person who gives us freedom and that is Jesus Christ God's son and so I'm so excited to talk about him today um, because my goal in life is to live out his love my dad always told me you might be the only Jesus anybody ever sees you might be the only Bible anybody ever opens to read and so I hope today that his words will shine out through me and that it won't be me that you're looking at me um, that you are hearing from but actually him I'm just like his mouthpiece um, Matthew started out the series finding freedom with commitment and he talked about when well, we're on that next step of our faith, wherever you are in your faith, commitment is one of the things that's going to anchor you when everything else around you is going crazy. And when you're in a storm, the day in, day out, getting up, deciding to put on your armor and follow a God who loves you when it doesn't seem like he does. So commitment. He talked about the tools that um, we are given. And those tools, the, his word, the people around us, his Holy Spirit inside of us is what enables us to take that next step, even when we can't do it ourselves. And the people around us pick us up and hold up our arms. And he talked about, I love the image. He was on this side of the stage, and I love the image that he gave. He was beating the chains with his hammer. I've also talked about breaking those chains. He was beating the chains with the hammer. And he said, and when you can't beat anymore, you give it to your friend that's beside you. And then let them beat for you. That's where this message was birthed out of. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal testimony with fear lately. But I needed somebody to take up that hammer and beat that chain for me. Um, and this is not something that just goes away. You know, we all have different chains that are being broken. When you're maybe a new Christian, you just come to the faith, it's going to be chains like your unbelief, your questions that you've had about God. And then it might be, you might be set free of an addiction or um, something that's kept you from him, like fear. Um, but it's always something constantly. Um, since the beginning, we are humans. Adam and Eve, there was something that kept them from God, and that's their sin. So it's just in our sin nature to be fearful. Um, the second time 
that we came together, we talked about finding freedom from depression. He talked about three different kinds, um, medical, circumstantial, and spiritual. And he talked about whose problem it was, whose fault it was. And it was an honest sermon, and it hit me deep because we can use some things as an excuse, and then sometimes we can't use it as an excuse. And that's what the spiritual depression was. When we're out of God's will, we're far from him. He never leaves us. We're the one who moves away from him. Um, so the next natural um, thing that we felt we would go to is fear, which we all feel. And from the smallest child like Eli to the oldest adult that we have here, the oldest person in the world, we're all afraid of something. I don't care if you're the biggest, burliest man, there's something that makes you afraid. Um, so today, if you'll go ahead and turn with me to John 10:10, 10, 10, we'll get started. Um, this has been at the top of all of our sermon outlines. And if you um, didn't get a sermon outline, they're on the back. We might can have somebody, if anybody wants one, raise your hand. We can have somebody to bring them to you. I'll be following along there. Um, but this is a very popular verse, John 10, 10. If you um, have been a part of the church for a long time, you've probably seen this verse. If you haven't been a part of the church for a long time, then you've probably seen Christian people talking about it. And you're probably like, Wait, here they go again with that Christian phrase about the thief's, you know, the thief is stealing something. Um, but it's so powerful, so I don't want us to miss that this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn to that. It's such a simple statement, but it has a lot of power behind it. The thief, and that's Satan, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose, that's God's purpose, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all their purpose, they exist to give them a rich and satisfying life. That them there, I'm an English teacher, so um, that part is talking about his children, those who have confessed that Jesus Christ is their Savior and that they want to live with him and serve him forever. Um, that is who the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit exist. His main purpose is to give us a rich and satisfying life. Another word for rich and satisfying life is abundant. And when I think of abundant, I think of water just flowing out of something, okay? Or when you get all you can eat food and it's just brought to your table. I love to eat. Just brought to your table. Just continuously brought to your table. I love that. Maybe you think of Thanksgiving or something like that where you see a lot of different food. Um, but that is what he exists for. It's in his nature. And it's in our nature to be simple, to be fearful, uh, to be depressed and worried about things. Because guess what? We really can't control this life that we live. We really can't um, stop the things happening that this life brings. Um, we in our human nature fall so short of the glory of God. And that's one thing I need to start out and need you to know that just in our main nature, we cannot understand fear. You know, there's a thing, um, a whole lot of different quotes about fear and about um, being afraid. But one that always got me is when you talk about um, there's the only thing to fear but fear itself, you know. And I can't remember who said that, so don't get me wrong okay but you know I, and I sat down and I thought God can I even really understand comprehend this fear and I felt like he really told me you know he's the only one who can see everything he is an all-encompassing God so he's the only one in his wonderful nature who can see everything and I can't even though I like to plan out everything I like everything to be on its p's and q's except for being somewhere on time because that's my uh, that's my thorn in my side. I struggle with it. I'm going through a rehab program, though. Matthew has put me on. Um, and the first one is no excuses. That's the first rule. So y'all pray for me in that. Um, so the next thing, when we go back to John 10.10, 10, when you're talking about stealing and killing and destroying, this last word right here, destroy, means that the enemy, his nature... You know, God's nature is all-encompassing. He understands everything. We can't. Just go ahead and get that down. 
The thief's purpose, his nature though, is to destroy, to render you useless to the Lord on this earth. Okay, he wants to destroy you. I love that, render useless. I mean, think about anything you have sitting around your house and if something happens to it and it's useless, its purpose is gone. You don't even need it anymore because it's useless. Um, when we face our fears, we release the power of an almighty God in our life. We release the power of a God who understands everything. So that's what I want you to understand. If my fears are over here and I've been turning my back to them, whether they're small, big, little, anything, when I face them and I confess that those are fears in my life, then it gives God the power to come in. And you're going to see this image soon in the message to come in and pick you up and to address those fears with you. He's not going to leave you alone in addressing those fears. All right, so here's a little confession for you all. My biggest fear, now it's not just a fear, it's an earthly fear. Because I don't know if you know this, but we can have earthly fears and we can have eternal fears. I'm going to say that again. We can have earthly fears and we can have eternal fears. Fears that will last forever. Um, my biggest earthly fear is losing the ones I love. I don't know, it, can anybody testify to that with me? Losing the people that are around you, that give you so much joy and pleasure, um, whether it be my friends, my family, um, that is my biggest fear, especially my husband and my new son. Um, losing one of them would just, you know, I can't imagine going on the next day. I look through Facebook and I see so many people, you know, becoming a new mom that hits hard. Um, so many people who struggle with um, losing babies before they're, they're even born. That is a person, I believe. And they lose them. And then I just can't imagine never knowing them. Or they deliver them. They live for years and then they lose them. I just can't imagine that. And some of you here today, that has happened to you. One of our good friends to, um, today is her son's birthday, but he's not celebrating it here. He's celebrating it in heaven. And guess what? She's celebrating here too, even through her hurt and her pain. I saw this morning, she's celebrating here on earth. So that's my biggest earthly fear. But my biggest eternal fear, so eternal, that means beyond this life is standing before the God who created me, who knit me together in my mother's womb, who has allowed me to live this long, standing in front of him one day. And I imagine it's going to be even brighter than these lights because I really can't see any of you. Um, being so bright in front of me and him saying, Michelle, Michelle, why didn't you use everything I gave you? Why didn't you use it? I gave it to you, did great things, you loved people, you shined my light, but, but you had this. You had this ability. You had this ability to write, to speak, to love people, to do small things for people. And you, you didn't do it. What happened? Were you afraid? Why were you afraid? I was right there with you. That's my biggest eternal fear. And maybe it's different for you. Maybe your biggest eternal fear is not knowing what's next. Because I'm inquisitive. I like to ask questions. Matthew gets very tired of it. Um, why is one of the questions I like to ask. All right, this morning it was, did you get the Allen wrenches for the door? I wonder if a man named Allen invented those wrenches. Um, just questions like that, you know, that don't even make sense. I like to ask. So you know I'm going to ask a big question like, when I die, do I stay here a little while or do I, is my body just there? Am I going to see the ones I love, which is my biggest earthly fear? Am I going to see them in the next life? So I understand if you have even bigger questions, even bigger fears than just, you know, am I going to disappoint the God who created me? But imagine that. Imagine looking at his face and there being something that he gave you that you didn't use and you had no excuse why you didn't use it. No excuses, right, Matthew? No excuses. The first thing in my rehab, first rule in my rehab program. All right. So 
now that you know my biggest fears, I want you to be aware when you turn around and face your fear, you can go ahead and put that next slide up, Rachel. You need to be aware of this, all right? Because this is what John 10.10 10 tells us. It says, in each new season of your life, Satan's goal is to make you fearful of what he can take from you. If you have that outline, circle that, take, because that is a key point in today's message that he gave me that he wants you to know. It is that Satan, in his nature, takes. That's what he does. So go back to John 10.10, please. I'm making you work this morning. I'm sorry. Um, Everything, if you look at it, stealing is taking. All right, killing is taking something away, and destroying is taking something's purpose away. So that's what Satan wants to do. You got to be aware of this, guys. We have to be aware every day that Satan wants to take things from us. All right, he wants to take you away from your destiny, he wants to render you useless. So that's one of the main things, all right? And everybody knows that Matthew and I have just about seven weeks ago had the most beautiful baby. Now, y'all's babies are cute, and I love them too. And I never thought that it was true that when you have a baby, yours is the most beautiful baby. And Matthew, uh, he denied it. He said, all babies look the same. They're all going to be ugly. They all look scrunchy. And literally, I feared I did. This was a deep fear. And Matthew laughs at me about it. I feared that I was going to push that baby out. And Matthew was going to look at me and say, just like every other baby, (laughs) squishy and ugly. And I don't know what Michelle Galloway would have done. Y'all know me. You know my nature. And I just, I I wanted to still be Michelle even when I gave birth. I didn't want to be that person that they were like, oh, you don't want to go in that room. She's crazy. Um, And thankfully... I kept, you know, my nature, and I I was good. And thankfully, Matthew, by a miracle, did not look at me and say, he's just like every other baby. He said, he walked down the hall to his mom, and he said, no, mom, he's he's beautiful. You know, and that did my heart good. Did God still answer prayers? Because that was a miracle. I was literally afraid of that. And y'all know how Matthew jokes, but I was really afraid of it. Um, As a parent, though, I've been told this many times, you know, It hurts me more, parents would say this, when you're crying than it does hurt you. Okay, yeah, discipline hurts me more to discipline you than that. But my mom and dad used to always tell me, I just, I want to help you. I want to help you. What are you going through? I want to make it better. Um, And some things, you know, through life, if you have teenagers right now, you are learning some things you can't decide for them, some things you can't protect them from. And you just have to surrender and trust the God in them that you have raised them to have. Um, I don't know who that's for this morning, but I just want you to know that there's grace in that because he loves you and he gave you that child as a gift for a reason. And he's entrusted them to you so that you can trust them. Now, as a parent right now, one of the toughest things for Matthew and myself is when Eli does this one cry. And I have a picture. Okay, I know we're really bad parents. Let me check my time. We're really bad parents because we took a picture of our baby crying. But he's so cute when he does it. But it breaks our heart. So this right here, he got after me, that little um, lip. When I am about to cry, my lip quivers. And it does that. Um, And this cry that he does sounds like this. That's what it sounds like. So I'm in the next room, or I'm walking around, and he's got gas pains like his daddy, and he's going to, it's not your normal cry. I told you, he don't really cry a lot. We're blessed with this, and we've heard the third one's going to be, I don't know what, but we'll see if we have three. But when he does that cry, I'm serious, y'all. The mommy instinct in me, the daddy instinct in Matthew, it, it hits both of us hard. We run over there, and we're like, we scoop him up. And we were like, baby, what's wrong? What's wrong? You know, and I I try to feed him. I try to make everything better, but it's just gas. And he's just got to kick his legs and get it out, even if I give him gas drops. And that face right there, though, breaks my heart. And you know, if it's gas 
I can give him gas drops. I can give him things to try to help. But he still has to get it out. As funny as that is. All right, well, I want you to keep that image in your mind today because it's going to connect to what God does for us. Um, if you'll go ahead and turn to Luke 12 in your Bibles, I'm going to get started on that in a second. Um, as a parent, you know, you, you have the baby and you want to stay home with the baby and everything's going great. And then you go back for a checkup and you find out that you have to have something else. All right. Now, it wasn't, if you see my Facebook post, I had to have a little procedure and it wasn't bad like other people have had to have. It's not brain surgery. I knew all this stuff, but when I came out of that doctor's office and Carrie, my sister-in-law, went with me, she said, wow, you're being so strong. I would be freaking out right now. I'm like, I was driving home. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. God is good. And I'm just driving home, you know. And the next day, though, when I'm by myself, and I'm, well, I wasn't by myself. I was with Eli, and I'm looking at this baby. Fear just stepped in, and it started to beat me down. I started to think, you know, what if something happens to me? I wasn't really afraid I would die because I'm not trying to be that dramatic. Um, but I was like, what if it causes me not to be able to have children? Because a family member went through this very same thing, and for seven years she still hasn't been able to get pregnant. Um, what if it damages me? Or I meant just on and on. One of the biggest ones was, how am I going to pay for this? Because in one week, I found out I had to have some dental work. I had to get new glasses. If anybody's seen my glasses, you know I have to pay a whole lot of money for them thick babies. They're thick. And the last thing, I had to go back and have this procedure. And if you get a bill from Vident, man, you know those bills come in. Thank the Lord for insurance. But I was scared. And I felt like this is not anything Matthew put on me. I felt like I was a burden. I said, why am I such a burden? I know all those bills are rolling in. I'm about to go back to work. I'll, I'll get that paycheck, but I got a car, and I got we got a house, and now we have this baby, and we got daycare. And I felt like I was adding one more thing on to our family, even though I couldn't help it. But all those fears started to just take my joy away. So even though they're not as big and serious as what somebody else goes through, you know, they were fears. And you know, God still wanted me to turn around and to tell him what my fears were, even though they might have been small. I'm not trying to say, oh, Michelle's trying to create this testimony that she's been through that's awesome and going to rock everybody's world. No, I'm just trying to be honest. This was a fear. And to me, it was a, a big fear. Um, so that's why I wrote that post on Facebook. And I, I really, I needed that friend to come to me. I had a friend that took this hammer for me and started beating that chain and beating that chain. And she told me something. She said, Michelle, you know, fear is something that's from the enemy. All right? But God is love. And if God is love, then I know that love is a greater emotion than fear. So let's be motivated by love and not fear. And so I took that in. She didn't just tell me it was going to be okay because I deep down knew that it was going to be okay. I just needed somebody to stand with me and, and fight that fear with me. So fear prevents rational thoughts and tries to make us forget God's promises and faithfulness. In that moment of feeling all those different emotions, I was losing sight of all that God had done for me before. I mean, come on, I had just had a baby and it only took 45 minutes to push. That's amazing, I was so thankful for that. And the epidural worked, praise the Lord. And I was just so thankful for that. And I came through all that and I was, I meant, not as afraid of that as I was of this little thing. And so, yeah, it wasn't rational, it didn't make sense, but it was a fear and it was real in my life. Let's go to um, Luke 12. In Luke 12, Jesus was teaching the big crowds that came around to see him. And, and we're in Luke 12, 22. And just to give you a little background, Luke 12, 21, he is talking to the crowds and he tells them, Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. 
So when you talk about where you're storing up your wealth, where your trust is, is it here in your earthly things? You know, go back to my earthly fears, your people here with you on earth. Is it, is it here with things that are going to pass away one day, your material possessions? Um, or do you pursue? Would you surrender it all? That is so hard to say when we really stand and say, God, I surrender all, like that old hymn. Would you really? Would I just give Eli back to God? Would I really be that strong to say, here you go, you can have him back. However long a life he lives here on earth, all right? He's yours. Would I do that? That's when you get answering some tough questions that you can be faithful all day and think you are, but when you get asked a question like that, that is tough, and it will shake you in your boots. So I just want you to know that's what he had just told the crowd, that you need to have a rich relationship with God. You're a fool if you don't, really. All right? So let's go to verse 22. He turns to his disciples. These are the people that have been walking with him, following, following him, his buds. He's pouring, them, he's pouring into them because he knows one day he's going to leave. So follow along with me. Then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. For life is more than food and your body more than clothing. That's one thing I, I forget when I read this passage a lot because it's talking about worrying about food and what you're going to wear. But the key thing there is life is more. Life is more. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for God feeds them. And you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over big things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon, in all his glory, he was one of the most richest people in the Bible, most blessed person in the Bible, in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Here's one of those earth-shaking questions that he asked his disciples. Why? Do you have so little faith? And don't be convinced about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. This is key, guys. These things dominate thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already knows your needs. He just didn't say the word God there. God knows all your needs. He said, but your father knows all you need. So don't be afraid. And I love this little part because it's like Jesus with the people, his little followers right there in front of him. And he's, he doesn't say, don't be afraid, guys, bros. He says, don't be afraid, little flock, little flock. In John 10, 10, he was also talking about himself being a good shepherd and we're sheep. All right. He uses a lot of analogies in the Bible, a lot of metaphors that I love and, and honestly wish that I could teach English out of, out of this in school, but I don't teach at the right school for that right now. But gosh, look, so don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. All right. So don't be afraid, little flock. He calls you his sheep because he's the good shepherd. And that's what he was telling his friends there that day. All right, go to the next one. Satan takes. He steals, he kills, he destroys. Somewhere along the way, when we're afraid, we forget we are children of a good father who shows us, shows us his love by what he gives us. If you look down in verse 32, it said, So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. When Jesus came down, he died for our sins. Guess what? We are a child of God. We're co-heirs with Christ. What that means is Christ stands before us in God, the Father who is perfect and who cannot touch any sin, all right? He sees Jesus instead of all of my sin. And yes, I have things. I have things that, even people pleasing, which was one of my things, you know, it's not aired out like everybody's laundry who you think it's dirtier than other people's. But guess what? People pleasing, 
where drugs and and all these different things are very um, public people pleasing is a very private thing where you actually put the wants and needs of others before the God who created you and who loves you and guess what he doesn't want us to do that and that is something he needs covered by somebody who's perfect and that was Christ and it gave him great happiness do y'all know God's a happy God He's not a mad person or a person with a stick who wants to beat us into shape. All right, he loves us. One thing we pride ourselves here on the church is that we get to have fun, and we want to have fun when we come to church. We don't want to be people who are sad about coming and entering into worship with God. All right? Our religion, what we choose to believe, contrary to other religions, I'll be honest with you because I've studied some of them, all right, where God is going to punish you if you don't do good things or their God is going to, um, he wants, he's out to get you, all right? Our God's not like that. And that's what we have to keep reminding ourselves of. All right, show that second picture of my baby. Woo! There he is. He also got this from me, this dimple. But I, I've been told he has Matthew's, um, like, nose and mouth or something. And I, I know he does because he looks just like it when he's with him. God doesn't like to see me, you, like that first picture where he goes, oh, and he puts his lip down. All right? What it does when I can go and I scoop up my baby and when I put him in my arms and he's better and he stops crying and if he smiles at me, it gives me great happiness. Great happiness to give whatever I can to make him not afraid, not hurt. Not to have to go through things in life that are hurtful because life I want you to know this in its nature here on earth in our nature it's not going to be a perfect place all right that's why that is why we have to look forward to something else one day that's why we don't want here to be perfect that's why we kind of want some days that are sad because if you're never sad you never know what happiness is all right so be grateful for those days they push you closer in relationship in a rich relationship with your heavenly father they remind you that you are not big and you are not bigger than your fears bigger than your problems but god is i love that all right so i want you to have this image of this smiling baby god wants to see you like that i don't know if you know that today but he does he wants to see you happy he doesn't want to see you afraid all right of what he's called you to do Let's look at somebody real quick, because I know Matthew's going to look at his time, but let's look at this real quick in 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 7. Uh, this is Paul talking to Timothy. He was like his understudy that was about to take the reins when um, Paul was no longer um, doing his thing anymore. So he had, he had taught somebody how to take on the next line for the Lord. And what he tells Timothy is let me get mine in, in the wrong thing second timothy here we go all right what he tells him he's kind of like encouraging him to be faithful and he says this is why i remind you to fan into the flames the spiritual gift god gave you when i laid my hands on you for god has not given you or us a spirit of fear and timidity but of power love and self-discipline i'm so glad i pulled off that word because matthew would have picked on me all right so he's not given us a spirit of fear this is another one of those popular verses that we hear but i couldn't not include it in this message on fear all right because what's important for you to know is that but there um i'm not going to tell you but i like big butts in the bible and i cannot lie because y'all like that y'all like that thank you thank you thank you 
oftentimes in the Bible, you know, now Sarah, you're with me. We love language. We love words. And the language and words, that's why I like some rap songs. I'm not going to lie about that either because they're such a masterful creation. I don't like all the ones that talk about dirty stuff and all that. But masterful creation, creators of words and of language. And a lot of times the language that's in the Bible, it's for a reason. You can look and you can say that but, that comma, that period, that exclamation point was put there for a reason. And this is it. But this is the spirit he's given us. Power. Not our power. Because our power is not wonder working power. All right. It's in the blood of the lamb. His power within us. Love and self-discipline. That self-discipline to stand up every day and take a next step. That commitment when you commit. It's so beautiful. Um, there's a quote from Lisa Bervere. And she is the wife and author um, of um, John Brevere and he wrote Good or God and he also wrote The Bait of Satan which if any of you have struggled with offense if you're offended by somebody in your family or somebody you love or somebody you just don't even know they work with you and they get on your last nerve please please I beg you to get that book it set me and Matthew free of a lot of things it was awesome she said in a quote the enemy does not attack you according to your history what you've been through. So you've already fought that battle of fear that your wife might not be faithful because somebody's burnt you before. All right? You might wake up every night feeling lonely, feeling like the next person you're with is going to walk right out of your life just like everybody else has. All right? But you fought that. You overcome it. You, you face that fear. But now it's something different. All right? The enemy does not attack you according to your history. He attacks you according to your destiny. He attacks you according to where you're going, which is a lot of what we're afraid of, all right? I didn't harp on what fear is in the Bible and everything like that. What I want you to get is the devil wants to take that away from you. He wants to take your destiny and the very purpose that you were created. He wants to take it. He wants to render you useless, all right? But God wants to give to you. Give. He gave you these spiritual gifts like he gave Timothy. Timothy was right there ready to work for the Lord. And it was so easy for him to be afraid, for him to not go and do what he was made to do. All right. In 1 John 4, 18, it says, Such love has no fear, but perfect love expels. That means drives out all fear. When we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. I want y'all, I want this to hit you hard, okay? Because what that means is, if you are a believer and you have confessed that Jesus Christ is your Savior, then you believe that he will save you, all right? You believe that with everything you are, all right? But when we're afraid, we're looking back at that same person who's going to stand in front of us and save us, and we're afraid of him. We're afraid that we're going to be punished. What does punishment do? Punishment takes from you, all right? This is what the Lord has shown me. There's punishment again. It's not giving to you. All right, if you're a teacher, you know the whole switch in the mindset of education now is to not say, um, do not roll back in your chair. Um, do not speak out in class. Do not pick your nose while I'm teaching. All right, or for me, um, do not, oh gosh, I can think of so many things. Oh, that scared me. But and I'm about to go back in two weeks. But, you know, do not, Get up out of your seat and go hit somebody or something like that. It's not that bad, but do not do those things. We don't use that language anymore. We have to use positive reinforcement. We have to give to them. All right, so use your quiet voice in class. Keep all four um, chair legs on the floor. All right, it gives a positive mindset. It's supposed to make everything better. I mean, it does in a lot of ways, but we don't want to take, 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 and keep reminding kids and students of what they're not supposed to do. We're supposed to remind them what they are supposed to do. All right, so in fear of punishment, when we fear, we're feeling, fearing that the very God who wants to, who gets great happiness to come and scoop us up and love us and make us smile 
is trying to take something from us. And, and guess what it says? It says, then you have not fully experienced his perfect love. So maybe there's some of you today that aren't experiencing his perfect love. And guess what? When I was afraid and I didn't turn around and face my fears and tell them what they are, he knows them. But don't I want Eli, the one thing that bothers me so bad right now is he can't tell me what's bothering him. I don't know if it's gas. I don't know if his, he's still hungry. All right, and that just stresses me out because I provide for him and I want him to be taken care of. So, when you think of punishment, you think of taking. When you think of love, you think of giving. So today, I really want you to ask yourself, have I experienced this perfect love that wants to give to me when I'm afraid? I'm going to be afraid. If you haven't figured out that today, you're going to have fears. I can't tell you a perfect way to take all your fears away or anything like that. But I can tell you what God tells us to do. He said, abide in me. Abide in my love. I'm not trying to make this simple or anything like that. Too complicated. I want you to see the perfect picture that he gives you. In my Facebook post, I talked about but fear. I told you I like big butts and I cannot lie. But love. But love steps in. In Romans 8.38, it tells us that nothing separates us from the love of God. All right, even the best parent on this earth, there are parents who have separated their love from their children. They've done something. They've written them off. Maybe you were one of those people. Your parents wrote you off. Maybe you wrote them off. I don't know. That love is separated. It can be repaired, but for a time period, that love was cut into. All right? But nothing. Think about the worst thing anybody in this world could ever do even standing there cursing God or like Peter denying that you even knew the person you walked with forever and loved but then he took him back in all right even that nothing can separate that and you know how I know that because Romans 8 30 I mean 8 20 yeah 8 38 it's in the Bible and I'm going to tell you I don't question his word because I know him here. And that's the one thing that's so hard, especially with new believers. You're like, how do you know God talks to you? When do you know what he says and all that? That's weird, all right? But when you have a relationship with him, you just feel his nudges. You feel the Holy Spirit teach you about Jesus, all right? Because we're not perfect, but what we're doing every day is a step closer to him. We're never going to make it. We're never going to reach this perfect hero that we have in our minds. We can't touch him, but we can get one step closer to his nature every day. So as the band comes up, one thing I want to ask you all today is one thing that Matthew asked me the other night when I was laying in bed and I was just going over. I was like, I'm going to have to like figure out how to, to plan um, my plans for school and I'm going to have to figure out how to cook dinner and still do the stuff for the church because I'm about to take back on those responsibilities and then how are we going to see our families every day and this is literally like he's laying beside me and I'm going this and I'm like and I just maybe I can stay till 5 o'clock at school and if I pick him up at 5 o'clock then I can go home and I can feed him then I can do the food um, for us but then how are we going to have time together and then how am I going to like go to sleep by 9 and then, and just on and on and on. And you know that? That was worry. I'm worrying. Just like that verse said, look, he takes care of the birds. Don't you think he loves you more? He created you for relationship. He didn't create the birds for relationship. He did that so they could praise him. All right? But he created us for relationship. And I sit there. And Matthew says, Michelle, it all comes down to, and I knew this was about to be life-shattering and, tr and honest, because husbands and wives, if you're not honest with each other and you can't say the tough things, then who else can? All right, you're supposed to be one. You're supposed to be one. You're supposed to put God first, and they're supposed to keep you accountable in love. And he said, Michelle, it all comes down to this one question. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? All right, because when we're afraid, we're not trusting in his love. All right, and that hurt me in a good way. All right, because I'm, you know, I, I want to think that I'm doing the right thing and I'm 
spending time with him but I fall so short and when he said that then all these questions arose in my mind do I trust his love for me do I trust the very thing that we stand before a church and proclaim do I trust something that I've walked with for 19 years all right everybody looks at me and thinks I'm this person that has it all together but really behind me do I have all these things that are just making my testimony not even a testimony or am I stepping out a depression I've dealt with that too anxiety take medicine for that honestly am I taking a step every day in trust in faith because where Satan wants to attack me for my destiny I can look back and say ha ha oh no Satan you got to look at my history you got to look at what God has brought me through day in and day out and for some of you it's even bigger things than what I can say I know today marriages have been saved in here I know today that people have been set free from people pleasing from drugs from depression they've been set free from things all over this past year and before you don't have to just come to this church all right because this is just a building the people are the church I know some of your histories and it's amazing to see what God has brought you from you have to remember that and I have to remember it too when I'm so afraid um if you'll put that picture up of um of Eli and, and Matthew last night Matthew didn't even know that I was going to put this up today um, but this book I, I bought for him the other day and, and you know if you've sing, sang the song Good Good Father it's by Chris Tomlin it's so beautiful it says you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's in his nature to be a good father it's in our nature to be afraid just like Eli cries that's the only thing he knows how to do to get my attention all right Matthew's reading him this book last night and I just love Eli's face he's listening um, he wasn't crying at this moment and the last um, line in this book I want to read to you today it says no matter what you say or do what you've said what you've done a good good father never stops loving you that's so beautiful just from a little simple children's book but you know where it was written first here and you know where it has to be written every day here you have to write it on your heart every day and I'm talking to you just like I'm talking to me because I can't get through every day without doing that I I feel the fear coming up I feel the anxiety it is a feeling that if you've never felt it before it just makes you feel like you're helpless because you are and you gotta say no 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 you gotta stop right there it's not an excuse you have to stop and you have to fight it with the tools that he's given you so Rachel if you'll go ahead and put up that um, second verse the song the band is about to sing this song is called for the cross and it is absolutely beautiful I'm going to read you verse 2 there in the ground sealed in darkness lifeless laid the frame of the father's son that's Jesus in agony God watched his only son be sacrificed he gave it all for me guess what guys God faced his biggest fear he lost his son that's my biggest earthly fear right he lost his son for me for you he gave him for us so when we're afraid gosh look at what he did he faced his biggest fear having to give up something that meant so much to him because he loved us all right would you give your son for somebody you didn't even who wasn't blood to you really so I want you when you sing this I want you to sing it proclaiming that God did for you what you couldn't do for yourself now I don't have to face my biggest fear because guess what there's people here that have lost their children which is my biggest fear lost their husbands and guess what 
I believe and have faith that if I lost mine, as hard as it would be every day to get up and take a step through that hurt, I would still see him one day. I would still see him in heaven because my earthly fear is not bigger than my eternal fear. My eternal fear is that I won't please the God who created me to please him, to shine for him. All right, so today, I want you, when you sing this song, proclaim God's love over your fear. All right, guys, y'all can get started. Go, I stand with the Body was broken, your love poured out. You bled and you died for me there on the cross. You breathed your last as you were crucified. You gave it all.
we sing that song, all I can think about is all of you and your faces standing before the Lord and Him saying, don't be afraid. I've made you for this. I created you for this. And more than anything, I sent my son so that it was finished. You don't have to worry about who you were. All right, guys? We don't have to worry about that anymore. That's not a fear that we should have. Every day we have to stand in and abide in His love. But look, that is what is going to conquer your fear. All right? One fear to the next fear. Keep saying it. Keep proclaiming it over your life, over your family, over your job. And I got something for somebody or for two people today. God is not your earthly father. Let that sink in. When you scream and when you cried, Ugh, when you were a baby, and your daddy didn't go over there and pick you up and pull you to his chest and make sure that you had that smile on your face, that's not the God I serve. And I want you to know that. All right? Stop putting that on God because he don't deserve that either. So for somebody in here, you need to know that God is a good, good father. He's not the imperfect, abusive, hateful, hopefully one day saved by grace father that you had here on earth. And he loves you. And it brings him great happiness to give to you. Give of himself. Give of his time. Give of his only son. If you don't know him today, I pray that you will listen and will proclaim that as we pray together. Dear God, I just thank you so much that you're a God that is worth serving, worth getting up for every morning. And most of all, that you love me. This is not a fake thing. This is real life, real dirt and grit, God. And we got to get up every day and we got to proclaim the things that you died to give us. So, Father, I know there are people right now in, him, in here that are not your children. Because they haven't proclaimed that love that you died to give them. They haven't taken it. It's a gift. God, I just pray right now where they are that you will speak to their hearts and they won't leave here without knowing a good, good father. God, I just thank you for your love. I thank you for your protection. Protect us. Remind us of your love as we walk out into this fearful world this week. We got things to be afraid of. But God... Oh, we serve a bigger God than what the devil tries to take from us. God, we love you. We praise you. I'd like to remind you all to stay. If you'd like to talk with each other for connections, we'll be up here in just a second. If not, go out and have a blessed day. Have an awesome day. Love and be loved.